I'll, I'll make a motion that the uh, um, contractor, the Kayard uh, company, be back in front of us in two weeks with an update with a final cutoff date of 30 days from now if uh, route is not secured in writing from uh, federal road officials. Then it's 60 days. No, it's 60 days or 25 Two weeks. Days. No, 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 no. Let me, be, let me restate it. Mm -hmm. Two weeks, another update. Because I'll be honest, it's been six months. I said six months ago, anybody go rewind that tape. If it wasn't done six months from now, I'd be ready to cancel you. So I'm going to give you another two weeks. Two weeks from now, you're back before us telling us what's going on. Something a whole lot more substantive. Some contracts from whoever your vendors are or your donors are going to be. Uh, and then in 30 days, the last meeting of November, if we're not a substantively, substantively a whole lot further than we are now, mm -hmm. I'd be ready to cancel the contract. So and what would be the city participation who was supposed to be, uh, who is, who is in the contract? That's about 45. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll second the, 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 the motion for the sake of moving Vice on. Mayor. Okay. Mr. Uh, Scott Gavin. Call, please. Okay, I want to just clarify the motion. It's Scott Gavin's motion to require, um, I guess, a presentation in two weeks before the council to reevaluate the status of this project with an update on the status of this project. And that's the motion from Councilman Gavin, seconded by Councilwoman Stagan. Did I get that correct? Yeah, but I want to make it more, more solid than that. It's nice if you come back and you give us a little bit more of a presentation in two weeks, but I need to see some stuff. I, I, would, I would hope we would want to see some stuff in writing. If okay, Waste Pro is, a, is, a, is a, a, a sponsor, what is Waste Pro's role? I'm so, I'm so confused at that. If this gas station is giving you $109,000, Let's have something in writing. I mean, if uh, we're just going to go by this way, far. Mr. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Galvin, it's not a, a gas station. It's a corporation who has many gas stations and many businesses. Okay. I'm sorry. And I, the I gentleman is right Mr. here Roll sitting. Call, please, Mr. Is, is right here. Councilwoman Steril? Yes. Councilman Galvin? Yes. Mayor Thun Lucy, Mayor Thundo? I'm abstaining. Okay. Yes. Councilman Ma Bename? Ma'am, I'm Wait. sorry. The motion is... Two weeks plus 30 days, right? No, it, it was just um, the motion yeah, that we have is two weeks. Two no, weeks and two weeks. <laughs> you said two weeks and two weeks. Mayor. Two weeks. Let me, let me restate. Yeah. It seems to be so unclear. I, I'm okay, trying to be clear. Let him reread. No, wait. Let him. Let him you make the motion. Let him say exactly what. Uh, I'm going to say November is. the 12th. That's the next All right. I'm then. sorry. Yes. At on November the 12th, I would like the Kayard Corporation to make another presentation with substantive details. If that's, if there's nothing more substantive two weeks from now, I would move to terminate the contract 30 days from now. Do I have to is, does that, does that yeah. fit the parameters of our agreement with them? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Crook. So, um, so we're I'm sorry, on. Mrs. Attorney, you said I cannot what abstain? No, ma'am. Okay. Mayor Dundro? Yes. Councilman Bienname? Yes. Councilwoman Keys? Yes. Measure passes 5 0. By the way, does that include uh, the city manager to work with us with the sponsorship as stipulated in the contract or is completely out now and in breach of the contract? I'll defer to the city attorney on that question from my standpoint. I don't know what our full legal, legal obligations are, uh, but I would expect that the manager would up, would, would. We will be complying with the contract. Okay. Uh, um, Council, I just have one question. Uh, we have we to done. keep on moving. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, we're done. Yeah. Mr. Manager, any uh, city events, progress update? And let's make that a short. Yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, I asked uh, Pam agenda. Solomon yeah, to give us yes. a uh, short Madam, Reader's Madam Digest. Mayor, um, point, of, point of order, there's a lot of people have arrived, I believe, to speak on an item, and I don't think they're aware that um, Which tabs D and G have been postponed, uh, the 123rd Street um, project. So I'd just like to make that announcement so anybody who has come to speak on that, um, it will not be heard this evening. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Manager? I, I asked Pam Solomon just to give a very brief Reader's Digestion, Digest I, version. I will do so. Good evening, everyone. 
It gives me great pleasure to just give you a, a few brief highlights of upcoming events, although we do have a busy season here in October and November here in the city of North Miami. We do have all of our events posted on our community calendar on the website at NorthMiamiFL.gov and also highlighted within our Celebrate webpage, which is NorthMiamiFL.gov forward slash Celebrate. Tomorrow, we have our annual State of the City Address as a uh, featured speaker is our very own Mayor Lucy Tondro. That will take place at the Greater North Miami Chamber of Commerce monthly luncheon, which is held at the Miami Shores Country Club at 12 noon. For more information, you can contact the Chamber office in the morning at 305-891-7811 um, to reserve your seat if you haven't done so already. That's tomorrow, Wednesday, October 23rd. Uh, for those of you watching our rebroadcast later. Biscayne Landing Community Forum will take place this Thursday, October 24th at the Joe Celestine Community Center. That'll be from 7 to 9 p.m. And the Celestine Center is located at 1525 Northwest 135th Street. It's uh, basically an update on the Biscayne Landing development and opportunities for businesses and residents. And it's presented by the Olita Partners Local Preference Office. That's represented here this evening. For further information, you can contact their office at 786-629-3337. This Friday, October 25th, we have our very popular haunted, uh, Halloween Haunted Trails and Kids Fun Zone. Uh, it's put together by the North Miami Parks and Recreation Department. It takes place at the Enchanted Forest, Elaine Gordon Park, located at 1725 Northeast 135th Street. It's from 7 to 11 p.m. The admission is $5 at the gate for ages four and over, but we do have pre-sale tickets that are on sale now mm -hmm. at the North Miami Parks and Recreation Department. That's $20 for a package, a family pack of five tickets. Um, so you basically buy four, you get one free with the pre-sale tickets. For more information, contact the Parks and Recreation Department at 305-895-9840. On Saturday, November 2nd, we are having a Garden of Hope dedication in honor of breast cancer um, and domestic violence awareness. And that will take place at the Griffin Community Center located at 12220 Griffin Boulevard uh, at 11 a.m. And it's being hosted by Mayor Tondru. For more information, you can contact the Office of the Mayor and Council at 305-895-9818. And skipping forward, um, in on Monday, November 11th, of course, it's a federal holiday. It's Veterans Day. Our offices are closed, but we do host our annual Veterans Day ceremony, and we invite, invite you all to attend. That takes place at our Veterans Memorial at Griffin Park, which is um, located off of West Dixie Highway at Northeast 123rd Street. The ceremony kicks off at 10 a.m., and we invite you to bring your family out to enjoy a lesson in living history. For more information, you can contact the North Miami Parks and Recreation Department at 305-895-9840. And um, just a little uh, save the date for our 39th annual Winter National Thanksgiving Day Parade. Please, if you haven't ever done so, we invite you to come to the city of North Miami on Thanksgiving morning to enjoy a real live parade. It's a wonderful event and we hope to see you there Thanksgiving morning, 10 a.m. More information on our web, NorthMiamiFL.gov forward slash celebrate. Thank you. Madam Deputy City Manager, hurricane preparedness? Any hurricane? I know there's none. None. You ride, Ms. Uh, Madam Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening. As the Mayor just said, we have nothing to report yes. for the hurricane season. Um, remember, five more weeks mm -hmm. yes. into the hurricane season. That's right. Um, I suggest that we take a five-minute recess, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, before we get into the agenda. Yes, ma'am. So that we can decompress. Thank you. to come back oh yeah oh yeah I forgot the gavel <laughs> yep the meaning is 
Now we are going to open um, citizen forums. Good evening. Good evening to the uh, staff, the council members, and uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, my name is Newton Sandin, President and CEO of OIC of South Florida. We're a community-based job training and workforce organization, and you've heard a lot about the Biscayne Landings training element of the project, so I'll be succinct with my comments. As you recall, I had the pleasure of encountering uh, the mayor and the city manager at the Congressional Black Caucus Convention. So I want to make two points really quick. One broad perspective and locally about performance on the project. One, I want you to know, uh, Madam Mayor, that you'll recall the comments we made at the, at the, the session held with Congressman John Conyers, who has a jobs bill as well. And I want you to know that what we have on our hands, guys, is a national model that folks are taking a look at. Incidentally, I think oftentimes companies come into respective communities and build and make money and walk away, and the community may benefit at the very best at aesthetic presentation to the residents. But what you have on your hands here is a requirement that in, in, in requires that they're investing in the training and the job placement of the cities, the residents of the community. So I want you to know that, incidentally, I'm leaving tomorrow morning to go back to Washington, uh, which the Congressman is interested in this model, to make sure that across the country, if in fact organizations, businesses that do construction in those respective cities, they require that those respect construction companies invest in jobs and training for folks as well. So I want you to know that. Secondly, on a local level, I just want to give you a report, because one of the things you asked about was how many people graduated. Well, I want to tell you that the NCCR training that we're doing on behalf of the Biscayne Landings Project, we trained some 39 people of only two did not graduate. That represents a 95% completion rate. The reason why that is, we believe, is because it's shorter in duration. Guys, we all know that aspiration without preparation leads to frustration. Oftentimes, our communities want jobs, but it requires for them to have those respective skill sets to be able to do that. The next phase is we're in the latter stage of working with the Biscayne Landings Project and the Olita Group to negotiate where we, in fact, can place and train, place people on jobs. It is very difficult. You know that oftentimes people need to know where their next meal is going to come from while also, also making sure they're required to get the job training necessary to be able to make that happen. So our shorter, our model, which is shorter in duration, is why you have a greater level of completion rate. So I want you to hear about what's happening nationally. I want you to know that, again, I'm going back to Washington. They're interested in these models where, in fact, when companies come into communities, they don't just come and make profit and walk away. They're looking at the city of North Miami as a model to, in fact, make sure that residents benefit across the board. That's Thank my you. report. Thank you so much. Wow, right on time. Hello, uh, my name is Isaac Lickfield. I was asked to come in today by Frank Wolland and speak in his place because he had other obligations he couldn't break tonight. Uh, for my background, I have a master's degree in public health and uh, I've lived in North Miami for a long time and I'm a little bit worried about some of the environmental considerations. The, new, the muni municipal landfill was before my time, but I thought it was closed. I'm disappointed that our city is letting the developers of Biscayne Landing use our land as a dumping ground for waste from construction sites. It really doesn't belong there. It belongs in a regularly lined landfill. It, what we have there is not a clean landfill. It doesn't belong there. There's two major pollution reasons <laughs> why. First off, we're dumping heavy metals there. And because of the fact that we don't have the correctly lined landfill there, uh, it can dissolve and leach into the groundwater, and it's harmful for the, all the fish and everything that lives in the bay. This is really bad. The slag is it's a point source of pollution. Now it's in our landfill. Uh, also, because from what I've talked with Frank about, he's not, we aren't satisfied that the testing we're doing to see if the pollution going to the groundwater there from the metal slag being dumped in the landfill, uh, we don't believe the test wells are in actually good locations or actually testing what they should be. The other major pollution problem we're getting here is that 
Uh, the major ingredient in the slag is called glassy calcium silicate. Uh, these are extremely small, fine particles that are used to lubricate the drilling equipment being used. Uh, the actual information sheet that uh, talks about the exposure to it says it can cause uh, lung injury, including silicosis. It says the product, the product may contain crystalline silica, which is a known human carcinogen. Some human studies indicate potential for lung cancer uh, from this exposure. Risk of injury depends on duration level of exposure. <coughs> so not only do we have this big, these big piles of dirty fill, which contain the slag material, it's piled up behind Costco and behind some of the homes in North Miami Beach. When the wind blows, these very fine silica particles become airborne. So. Uh, this is a major issue, and we're really hoping it gets talked about as much as it should be. Thank you. Thank you. You know, when you said open forum, I didn't know I needed to take a number. Those people ran up here so fast, and I was here first. <laughs> <laughs> next anyway. time, walk faster. <laughs> <laughs> I will. So I hope race. not to be here next time. I'm glad you're here to speak. Thank you. I'm, I need that warm welcome because I've been treated very unfairly. I gave uh, Mr. Antonin papers for you to see. It's regarding, pardon me? Marie Samuel, 12725 Northeast 12th Avenue, North Miami, Florida, 33161. And I'm gonna give a big smile to, to Mrs. Miss Monesteem, because <laughs> I owe her one. <laughs> anyway, um, that's my address, that's my name. Do you, do you guys have the code that I'm here to talk about? Well, anyway, I'll tell you then. Um, I've been at that house in for 40, 40 years, and I gave you this code so that you could tell me what it means because obviously I've been butting heads with code enforcement. Uh, um, Mr. Uh, Sergeant Blanchard, um, Val, uh, <coughs> Ms. Christie, and and Sergeant Jurega who's here. So maybe you could explain to me under the section 1019 where it says storage is prohibited. It's got like two sentences. Could you, and I f keep forgetting, I only have three minutes to talk, so just you know, let me know what that means about junk. Can you see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. No junk, I mean no, per no person shall keep, store, or allow to remain on any property, zone residential, within the city, any derelict junk or junk property which is visible at ground level from a street or other pub public or private property. Um, I didn't give you the, the other paper that I gave to Mr. Johnson about um, what I wanted to talk about on the agenda, but that has the address. The address I'm talking about is 12715 Northeast 12th Avenue. It's a triplex. It houses uh, seven people and it's just south of my property. And um, the man, the owner is Yuri Morales, under the name of Future Mosu 127 LLC. And he's got junk on my fence. And, and um, when my fence was put up in 1977 by code, by Lindsay Lumber, and, and the permit that I have shows, I have my rebar right in the front of my property. And, and, and this, this junk is hitting my fence. So beside that which code said is not existing, you have this section 1019 storage prohibited. And then if that's not good enough, you've got another code that says in section 5, 1701, all storage of furniture, appliances, or other items shall be within permanent buildings and completely obscured from public view. For each bedroom, da, 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 and then it talks about it has to be enclosed storage not on my fence, not where I can see it and where not, it's not visible from the street. And if I had pictures, I would show you, but I don't. I'm sure they do on their phones. And I came here to tell you to please ask that man to get his junk off my fence. Thank you. <laughs> oh, well, you know, we can go Thank further. You. It's we can okay. We, we got the picture. But you haven't got the, this part of the picture, the money part. I pay $1,200. $1,500 a year insurance because I have a modified, I have a, um, I have a, a modified mortgage and I, I'm required to pay the insurance. So if Mr. Blanchard or Sergeant Blanchard and um, one of the other people. Mr. Jurega, right? Jurega and Blanchard are telling. There we go. Yeah. 
if I turn around, I'll lose my place in my mind. <laughs> um, if they can tell the people that the other side of, okay, say this, say this is my fence. They're saying that this side of my fence belongs to the neighbor. So why am I paying insurance for the neighbor to have my fence? Got you. Okay. They damage the fence. I get the code violation. I have to do the repair. Thank you. Thank you. City manager, can you please um, get in touch with uh, Mrs. Samuel in order to follow up the junk situation on her fence? Yes, Mayor and Council. Thank you. I'm sorry, but is there going to be anything done further than that? Well, uh, I'm sure the city manager will contact you and explain to you what are the steps that he's taking in order to ensure that there's no junk on your fence. Okay. All right. Because everybody's looking, but nobody's doing anything. Got you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council, uh, City Manager, my name is Reverend Victor Caballero. I'm here because I noticed that North Miami being grown with the Spanish community. I want to be served to the Spanish community. I don't ask for nothing here. I just want to say that I'm in your order. If you can use us for the best of the, North of the city of North Miami. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. God bless you all. Are you a resident of our city? Yes. Wonderful. Welcome. And most of our people live in North Miami. Very good. Also, we've been participating in the city block that was great, that was good for the Spanish community. Right. I saw you in the fiesta. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Susan Luck. I'm a resident of Bay Harbor Islands, a neighboring community, and I have been following the Biscayne Landing uh, Superfund site for many years. I'm currently here because I'm quite concerned about the toxic landfill that has been brought in that this previous gentleman spoke of. My background is as a public health nurse. I actually teach environmental health in the family medicine program at the University of Miami to physicians. And just last Saturday, I used Biscayne Landing as an example of how do you identify toxicity when you're assessing pa your patients. This is a major concern, and I'm asking you to take this seriously. Aluminum, for example, is not regulated by the FDA guidelines, and the guidelines are inadequate to say what toxicity levels are. But I will tell you that I have in front of me journal articles from the Journal of Pediatrics on developmental problems in children in brain and cognitive function in the elderly in two recent uh, periodicals and journals from uh, the Alzheimer's community and the medical community. So what I'm here to say is that there's respiratory problems, asthma, uh, kidney problems because aluminum has to go through the kidneys and especially again in vulnerable populations and in the elderly it's particularly harmful and when I read in the recent report that it's the opinion that the benefits of the proposed soil reuse outweighs the potential negative risks. I ask the potential negative risks to whom? If it's your child or your elderly parent, the risk is real and needs to be taken into consideration when addressing this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Public hearing is now closed. Oh, still open. Mr. Privatel? Those who, want, who wish to speak, please come forward so that we don't waste time. Uh, William Prevatel, 11950 North Bay Shore Drive. Uh, good evening, everyone. I know that you have a, a great deal already on your plate, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, my concern is, is somewhat uh, directed towards our Department of Community Planning and Development. Um, we've had some changes lately, and I'd like to think that it might be an opportunity for us to reevaluate uh, how we've gone about um, some of the issues of this last year, at least, in that department. Uh, if I look back, we can see a number of particularly large projects, sometimes with subsidies, sometimes overwhelming their neighbors. Um, 
inevitably, these projects have received a double thumbs up. Uh, the more detrimental it has been to the neighborhood and to our community, they've received full support from our Department of Community Planning and Development. On the other hand, as you've witnessed a few weeks ago, when it came down to preserving open space at Griffin Boulevard at the canal, that was recommended to be privatized in opposition of, of people of the city. My own experience is just a few days ago on Wednesday when after a great deal of effort, when we had been basically stonewalled for a 10 month period, we finally appeared before the Board of Adjustment for our, an addition that was as of right. But we were asking for a little bit of concession in terms of a variance to get a rounded geometry so they could preserve the view for our neighbors so it could look better, so it could be a better project for the shoreline of North Miami. We did not get the support of our community planning and development and therefore the project at the moment has been shot down. But this just shows there has been a, a pattern of being the contrary indicator. And I, I'd hate for that to happen. I would like to see that, that going forward with this new administration and with possibly these change or changes that have taken place in the department, that I am asking for your blessing to speak with the city manager and to speak with our new interim manager of, of planning that we look at things a little bit differently. That we're not completely bound to numbers, but we use common sense. And finally, I'd like to quote Busminster Fuller in saying, uh, to change something, you have to change the model so that the existing model becomes obsolete. If we can do that, we can have a much better future for our city, a much better environment that all of us will be proud of, and it won't cost us an extra dime. It's just looking at things a little bit more positively. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Mr. City Good Manager, okay. can you please follow up with Mr. Privatel on that issue? My um, representative to the Board of Adjustment gave me a report of what happened last Wednesday. I would like to have a full report of what's going on exactly with this project. Please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good evening, Annie Montgomery, 2082 Laurel Lane. I didn't know I was going to have quite an audience, but here I go. I want to apologize to everyone that was in attendance at the council meeting on October 8th for my behavior. I let my frustration take over when my, our city attorney was asked by Vice Mayor Scott Galvin if tab L should be open to the public. And my, our city attorney said no. So once again, I just want to apologize. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Is that Miss Montgomery? Is that her? Uh, I don't know her. <laughs> Thumbs up for you, Madam Montgomery. Good. It's a proof of grandeur. You know that, right? Yeah, it's a proof that. of grandeur. Thank you. She's very good at that. She does that very well. Mayor, Vice uh -huh. Mayor, Council Members. My name is Charles Bartlett. I'm the District Manager for Malcolm Drilling, located at 640 South Miami Avenue, Miami, Florida, 33130. I'm here to speak because during the September 24th uh, council meeting, there were several um, statements made that I would like to address. Uh, one being that there was this uh, existing contamination on the on the Brickell City Center site, where the subcontractor uh, doing the soil cement process at, at Brickell, I'm intimately familiar with the process and the ingredients used, which are water and cement, nothing else. Um, there was no existing contamination at Brickell City Center, no heavy metals, no organic contamination of any kind. The site has been tested and it was tested and it was clean. Uh, there's no existing contamination migrating onto the site from adjacent sites. Uh, former Mayor uh, Frank Wallen mentioned that there was some contamination observed uh, off-site that may have migrated. There was some petroleum contamination and some utility work done out in the street off the site. None of this contamination was observed on the site by the environmental consultants. Uh, the other thing um, that was even mentioned today, oh, the reason why, another thing was, the reason why we're excavating is to remove this hazardous material and give it to somebody else. That, that's the furthest thing from the truth. The reason why we're excavating the site is to build a basement, a two-story basement. The only excavation being performed there is what's need necessary to build the basement. Um, another item that was mentioned is slag cement is uh, used as a uh, drilling lubricant. 
No, slag cement is used to solidify the ground so that it makes it impermeable. Slag cement and Portland cement and water, the ingredients used at Brickell City Center, are the same ingredients that are used in the concrete all around us. Nothing different. Uh, another thing, why, you know, why was slag cement used in the process? Why not uh, all Portland cement? Well, slag cement is environmentally friendly as recognized by the EPA. Uh, it's part of the Leeds point system for the project. Uh, and it's to be used as much as the extent as possible versus Portland cement. Thank um, you. The Your other time thing is, up, is sir. Your yeah, time I understand. Is up. Time is up. Thank you for hearing me. Yeah, you'll, you will have a chance to speak later on on that item, so if you need to uh, further time. Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Andrew Hellinger. I'm the receiver of the Oaks at Biscayne Landing. I rise to give you a short update on the Oaks and where things that are going on involving the Oaks. Mm -hmm. We have recently submitted design plans to the planning department. Those plans uh, are for the pool, the clubhouse, the security guard house, and they will be pending before your planning commission on November 5th. On matters concerning Biscayne Landing in, in general, um, Madam Mayor, yourself, council members, the manager, and directors of your planning department and public works have asked us to work with Olita, our neighbor and a, a tenant in Biscayne Landing like the Oaks, mm -hmm. to resolve issues that are site-wide and site-wide issues. These issues are the roads, ingress and egress, stormwater management, Olita's prior payment, promise of payment to the Oaks, and of course a master association to govern the whole property and those issues. We, we, we've worked diligently to get to that goal. I've updated some of you um, in private meetings. I've updated the manager and your planning and your uh, public works director often. In a August 27th meeting here before the city council, council asked that we meet with Olita. We did, we met uh, on September 18th. I thought we reached, reached an agreement on the terms that I, th those big point issues that I just mentioned to you our, our council for Oaks drafted an agreement. We delivered it. Six weeks went by. We heard yesterday that uh, what we thought was our understanding of agreement that the Olita people have found ways to do things that don't have to really deal with a site-wide issue and the, the items that, that were important to either us or to, or to your staff. And they presented us in it with an agreement that instead uh, has, us, has the Oaks joining a master association, providing a release, and agreeing to never talk about what happens at Biscayne Landing. Of course, without consideration, I as receiver have a fiduciary duty. I can't recommend that to the association. But I did update your manager and, and some of your staff, and we did promise to work through these issues and try and, and still move towards an overall uh, plan that we'll have for site-wide management. I'm not sure what has caused the change of position in Olito, but we have uh, promised the manager we would get to the bottom of why positions have changed and what has gone on in the last six weeks that has them change that. And I will update the manager and I'll update the council as, as time goes on. So the association have gotten their money? Oh, no. No, the, the, the latest agreement proposes no consideration to the association. We need an update from the manager. Okay. W Mr. Manager, I would like for you to sit down with us separately and give us an update on this issue. Yes, uh, this is going on. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor and Council. Good evening. Good evening. Madam Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, Council Members, my name is Dr. David Krause. I'm a toxicologist and a certified industrial hygienist. I, from 2008 till 2011, I served as the state toxicologist for the Florida Department of Health in Tallahassee. There I worked as a public health officer and um, oversaw many public health uh, events, consultations for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, as well as the Florida Department of Health, and worked with every county throughout the state on both the Chinese drywall issues, the uh, BP Deepwater Horizon event, and uh, the Acreages Cancer Cluster that some of you may have heard of. Um, I've been asked uh, as now a um, private consultant working with Geocentec consultants um, to help clarify some of the issues that have been recently raised regarding the, uh, the Olita um, fill issues and concerns and some of the statements and frankly off 
characterizations of the constituents that have been found within the uh, film material that is being uh, discussed regarding the, uh, the, the site. Um, the presence of a natural constituent does not necessarily make it a contaminant. The issues regarding um, uh, inhalation exposure to uh, silica and, and sand is uh, frankly uh, unlikely. Um, the size of particulates necessary to actually cause uh, ex significant exposure via the inhal inhalation route um, is unlikely via the um, scenario that's been described. In industrial situations where this literature has found silica to be a significant issue, yes. In the situations that we're looking at here, without mechanical means, unlikely. The issues regarding uh, aluminum and its association in the, in the literature as uh, with Alzheimer's and other neurological issues, most of that literature is associated with medical introduction of aluminum into people's bodies. The absorption rate of aluminum is very low from the environment. If the council has any other questions regarding toxicology and the way this, these constituents may or may not pose a health risk, I'd be glad to answer those. Thank you for your time. Thank you. M Madam Mayor, mm -hmm. just a quick question. Dr. Krause? Yes. Krause. Who is it that had retained you to give this opinion this evening? The, um, Mr. Uh, Charles uh, uh, Dumford. Okay. From Rickles. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, members of the council, Kenneth Each, <coughs> 776 Northeast 125th Street. Uh, tonight, as I was looking at the consent agenda, I see a resolution of the mayor and the city council, the city of North Miami, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War, providing for an effective date and for all other purposes. And if I may read on, I'm not going to read the whole resolution, but it says, Whereas through a decade of combat over air, land, and sea, these proud Americans upheld the highest tradition of our armed forces. And whereas a grateful nation, we honor more than 58,000 patriots who sacrificed their lives during the Vietnam War and remember those who were wounded and still carry the scars of war. As a Vietnam veteran, I was wounded three times. I carry the scars of that war. But the scars of that war that I have on my body didn't hurt me as much as the scars that I received from my fellow countrymen when we came back from that war. The pain, the disrespect, the insults that we were given hurt much, much more than the bullet wounds that I had received over there, especially when we were fighting for somebody else's liberty. I wear a crest for my Green Beret. It's called the Oppresso Libra liberation of the oppressed. And I want you to know that my war is over 45 years ago, but it's still like it is to me yesterday. I've seen good people die in the name of liberty, good people giving up their lives, as we do today around the world, in Iraq and Afghanistan and the Mideast. Many years ago, there was a movie called uh, Rambo. And Sylvester Stallone said something that was very profound. As a Vietnam veteran, he said all we wanted was our country to love us as much as we loved it. And maybe it took 45 years to say that. But I want to thank this city, this council, for loving us today as much as we loved you. Thank you very much for this proclamation. <laughs> It would be an honor for us to um, honor you once again for your sacrifices, for your sense of um, patriotism to this country. But I'm um, reserving my comments regarding wars, maybe for another time, when there's less emotion. Um, 
Do we have a motion to, for the consent agenda? <coughs> um, may I ask you quite a, one question on item C, please, just for discussion? Okay. Um, as long as nobody's saying no. Um, we have a new school that we're bringing into the city, or I understand the school has been with us. Uh, the actual uh, entity we're dealing with now is a brand new entity formed in 2013. Uh, since these people are going to be working with our children, I'm just hoping that, and I just want to put it on the record that I'm hoping that staff has vetted this company, uh, criminal background checks and whatever else it takes uh, to make sure that the children being served are protected and we're hiring the right people. To the mayor, councilwoman, yes. Okay. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? There are only three items on it. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Anybody wishes to record a nay? Okay. Right. <coughs> Tab E. Mm -hmm. Come on, Scott. Proposed resolution of the mayor and city council of the city of North Miami, Florida, approving the renewal of health insurance coverage for plan year 2014 with United Healthcare as the healthcare insurance coverage provider for the city of North Miami employees, and further authorizing the city of Ma the city manager to execute all necessary documents to effectuate said coverage, providing for an effective date and for all other purposes. Public hearing is open. Public hearing is now closed. Do we have a motion? So. I'm Go ahead, go. So move tab E. I second it just for elaboration from the city manager. Yes. Mm -hmm. you just tell us a little bit about what's going on. Is, do we stay with the same rate or there's an increase and why do we choose the same company again? Um, Was it put out for bid? Yes, uh, through, through the mayor, councilwoman. Uh, I do have our agent of record here um, who can give a short version as to how this transpired, if it so desires. I would like to defer them who can better provide an explanation. Sure. I They're asked uh, Saposnik yeah, Group to come. The one that said that was oh, on. yeah. Oh, yeah. He looks so much Where like Mr. Cavallo. I thought it Where was the are. superintendent from China. far. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 I almost recognize him as the superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, City Manager. I'm Andrew Goodman with Saposnik Insurance and have been representing you for quite some years with your employee benefits. Uh, as is typical for us every year, we put your uh, insurance out to bid with all viable carriers in the area. An analysis was done, side-by-side -side comparison of all carriers available to you and their proposals. Um, after evaluation by your City Manager and your Personnel Director, it was determined that the best course of action was to renew with United Healthcare um, and Neighborhood Health Partnership. The base plan, which is the plan that the city contributes towards, is renewing at a 9% renewal increase over current rates. Uh, so slightly be below trend. Uh, we've had a very good run with United Healthcare. Our renewals have run annually far below the average. We have at about a 4.5% average over the last five years. Uh, as far as increases. Another so, question. I don't know if you have specific questions. Mm -hmm. Councilman Bienimi. City Manager, it's a one year contract, right? Um, we have, uh, this is a one year contract, yes. Okay. You said he, would, uh, he was out for bid. Um, we, as the agent of record indicated, every year they put out to bid the health insurance. The agent, of record, um, we have a contract with them who for acts five as years. a broker. Uh, yes. It so was that for five years. That's expiring yeah, his, this year. Their contract is um, expired. Yeah. We will be putting out the agent of records contract uh, in the upcoming year, which will probably go out shortly after January. Mm -hmm. um, whoever we select at that time, it's their right. role will continue to go out and put out to bid uh, to all of the insurance Have companies insurance. Okay. Um, to get the best possible rate. 
done? You done, Councilman? Yeah. How does it's that a one-year contract. Is expiring and we're renewing, renewing it for one year. Mm -hmm. Then in January, we're going to put it out for a bid. Not That's what it is. No. Not Mr. the insurance, just I, the agent, agent of record. I understand that. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and the health insurance itself with United Healthcare, the renewal is an annual contract as well. Okay. So uh, we're, not eligible, we're not eligible under the Obamacare? I'm sorry? How Aren't we eligible for the Obamacare? We can go in the marketplace. <laughs> Can we, as a city? Uh, oh. There is no yeah. large group marketplace. There's an individual marketplace, which we also take care of. Uh, and there is supposed to be a small group marketplace for the under 50 market, which is not yet open or available. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> but we will be representing that when it's available as well. <laughs> but nothing for the large group market. That was my, that was my question. Oh, that was your question? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, not as, as straightforward as the, the mayor just put it out there. I was going to ask. Um, how do we consider ourselves um, since um, the city managers mentioned that we hired you and then you actually put a bid out to select the the insurance company so do you um, see it as a mini marketplace or do you only have like two insurance like Yomana or, or you not because I know the last time a couple of years ago when we had to discuss it it's only two companies that actually um, come before us. If I don't right. remember, it was Umana and um, United. No, we, so Saposnik so Insurance it? represents all of the Signal? viable. Okay. We, we represent all the insurance carriers in our marketplace. So when we go out to bid, we go out to bid to all viable insurance carriers. They then make a determination whether they want to submit a proposal. We did have a couple declinations, but mm -hmm. we had multiple respondents, which are compared side by side so that you can do a, a comprehensive analysis to determine what is the best course of action as far as benefits and cost standpoint for both the city and its employees. After that evaluation, you made the determination that it was best to go with United Healthcare and NHP, but you were able to look at the entire marketplace before doing that. Uh, okay. Did you said we're going to have an increase of nine percent? Correct. From to, what to the paying? city's to the city's portion of the premium. The city's paying, not us. Right. This this the 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 city the the city not employees. What I meant. Okay. So the the city contributes against the base plan, which is pretty typical. So the core plan, mm -hmm. that plan received a nine percent increase. So the city um, budgeting would request would receive a nine percent increase. Um, there are multiple plan designs available. The other options are higher option, which are buy-up plans, and they have tiered different renewal costs depending on the plan itself. Okay. Any other questions? Madam Keys? No, good. Okay. Uh, there was a motion put by um, Councilman Galvin. Can you read the motion again? Is to approve? Is that yeah, correct? That's correct. It was a motion by Councilman Galvin, seconded by Councilwoman Vice Mayor Galvin, seconded by Councilwoman Sterrett, and it is a motion to approve this item. Okay. Anybody wishes to record a nay? On tab E. Item passed five zero. Thank tab you. Tab F. Technically four zero. Thank you. Ms. Sterrell's not on the <laughs> Four zero. Thank you. Tab F. Proposed resolution of the mayor and city council of the city of North Miami, Florida, designating Northeast 121st Street between North Bayshore Drive and 122nd Road to be known as Rabbi Jory Laneway or Rabbi Jory Lane Street in accordance with M Miami Dade County Street designation rules, authorizing the city manager to allocate and expend the necessary funds to cover the costs for signage and do all things necessary to effectuate the designation, providing for an effective date and for all other purposes. Public hearing is open on this. Public hearing is closed. Any I make, motion? I make a motion that we pass this resolution. Second. Open for discussion. Anybody wishes to record a no? Clerk. Item passes 4-0. Tab H. In ordinance of the mayor and city council of the city of North Miami, Florida, amending chapter two of the city of North Miami Code of Ordinances to update, organize, and clarify specific sections of the chapter, including substantive, legal, stylistic, and organizational changes, while providing cons consistent use of terms and correction of chivalrous errors, providing for conflicts, severability, codification, 
and an effective date. Is there, is there a motion to approve tab H? Motion to approve. Second, discussion? I like, um. Mm -hmm. Public hearing is open on it. Public hearing is closed. Uh, I'd like to know what the changes are. I've read this like twice and I did not have time to reread it <coughs> for a third time. So what were the changes that were made? Uh, the changes were <coughs> on page five. On page five of the ordinance, section 2-253, subsection two, expending funds in excess of $50,000 rather than $25,000 as was recommended by uh, you, Councilwoman Keys, in the, in the past. Actually, I recommended no change, but okay. I appreciate the lowering it. Were there any other changes on this? No, ma'am. Okay. Anybody wishes to record a no one item this is H? A roll call. This is an ordinance oh, roll call. Sorry. Mr. Clerk. Councilwoman Keys. Yes. Councilwoman Steril. Yes. Vice Mayor Galvin. No. Mayor Dundro. Yes. Councilman Bienname. Yes. Item passes 4 1. Tab I. In ordinance of the mayor and city council of the city of North Mi Miami, Florida, amending chapter 15 of the city of North Miami Code of Ordinances by creating article I entitled Department of Personnel in accordance with and following amendments mm -hmm. to the city charter and creating section 15-100 retirement incentive program in article three entitled Clarity Singleman Employees Retirement System Ordinance number 691 to establish a retirement incentive program for certain eligible members of the retirement system, providing for conflicts, severability, codification, and an effective date. Is there a motion on type I? Move to approve type I. Second. The public hearing is open. Public hearing is closed. Open for discussion? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I'm not in favor of this plan. And um, I, th I think the unfunded liability is way too great for us to take on. <coughs> I think we're looking at about eight to ten million. I don't see that we're going to be saving enough to um, make up for this liability. It's too great. I'm also um, very unhappy with this. I feel that we are um, going to lose an incredible amount of institutional knowledge. This is going to. This isn't. This is. A, this is an offer too good to refuse, and I think we are going to be losing an awful lot of our very talented uh, employees. I'm sorry that I'm not offering you all this great plan, but I'd like you to stay, and we're, we're just going to lose too much uh, for, for saving a few dollars to lose the inst institutional knowledge to bring in people at a lower rate with less um, knowledge, less experience is just really something we should not be doing to our city. Thank you. Mr. City <coughs> Manager. Yes, ma'am. Are we losing money on this? Uh, Madam Mayor, um, there is a salary savings that uh, we that will offset uh, any expense that we would have regarding this plan. Okay. From what I understand that you have said, explain to me, um, those employees who are willing to take that um, incentive plans, when you, uh, if the city is going to hire more people. Does that mean that there are lesser knowledge? We go in for the cheapest thing? Mm -hmm. Is that what it means? Or no. does it mean that they are studying at a lower level? It, it's, it's certainly everybody that we hire are qualified. Uh, today's market, I can tell you we have people in this city with master's degrees that far exceed the existing staff that I have that are working for $10 an hour. So um, is that a concern? No. Um, I, I think that anybody and everybody that we hire will always be capable, capable of performing the job. Uh, that's always been our goal. Uh, but just to show you what's out there, we have people in this city who are working part time with master's degrees who are doing a phenomenal job um, in this city. Uh, shamefully making ten dollars an hour but who are more educated than the existing staff that I have 
in some cases. Uh, Mr. Clerk, roll call. Oh, I have lots of questions. So. Oh, well. <laughs> what took you so long? I, I was just, I thought maybe you're going to go round robin or ask whatever, so if I may. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, is the uh, uh, actuary who prepared this evening's report present this evening? Yes, the uh, Jeff Ambrose is here, um, uh, available. Okay, but, but not Mr. Cordenew? Uh, Mr. Cordenew did not, is not, did not prepare any of these documents. They were done by our outside actuary, Mr. Jeff Ambrose. I see, I see. Okay, I'm reading. Okay, if, if, if I might be allowed, may I ask staff and the uh, actuary some questions? He's here. He's available. Good evening, Mayor, Good evening. Vice Mayor, Council. Thank you for being here. Sure. For, for the public that's not following along, this would allow some incentives to city employees of a certain tenure to retire early, calling it the Early Retirement Incentive Program. According to your report, potentially 112 city employees could retire under this plan. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Manager, how many city employees approximately do we have overall? Uh, we have uh, approximately around 450, um, what we call full-time employees. Um, I don't know the exact number for part-time employees. I could say for members covered under the pension plan, as of October 1, 2012, there were 256, but that doesn't include um, part-time members. It's just full-time members. As of October 1, 2012, there were 256 active members. So is this 112 of 250 or 112 of 400? For the pension plan, it's 112 of the 256 mm -hmm. okay. would be offered. So, them. And then that represents up close to 25% of our overall workforce general employees. Or a third, thereabout. Well, I, I won't, I'm not going to split hairs. It's a lot yeah, of people yeah. walking out the door. Sure. The police are referenced in here, but you don't give a specific number. Of our 110 police personnel, how many of those, in addition to this 112, might retire under this plan? If the same conditions are required to meet the um, eligibility requirements, in other words, you have to meet Rule of 60 by January 1, 2014, which means your age plus your service must equal or exceed 60, if you have to meet the normal or early retirement eligibility requirements under the plan and you have to have 10 years of service as of January 1, 2014, if that criteria is used for the police pension plan, there would be 11 members eligible for the early retirement or employee retirement incentive okay. program. You mentioned several times in the report that the ERIP early retirement incentive program mm -hmm. uh, the, the financial liability to the city could vary significantly depending on which specific members elect to retire. Um, and you'll say later on, the payroll savings is highly dependent on which employees elect to retire under the ERIP. What do you mean by that? Okay. A, a, a couple things with the payroll savings. It's dependent on many things. Uh, all of what we're doing is based on assumptions. The assumptions we were provided with in terms of when a member elects to retire under the ERIP, what would happen in terms of a member replacing them? We had assumptions that were provided to us by the city manager that was 60% of the people would be replaced. So 40% would not be replaced, and the 60% that were replaced would be earning 30% less. So for example, if someone was making $60,000 annually and they elected to retire under the ERIP and they were one of the 60% um, that was being replaced, they would come in making $42,000. So that's what we were talking about with the, uh, with the payroll savings. The payroll savings um, is quantified in our report, but it's, it's also a function of when the person would have retired without the ERIP. For example, if there's a member today who is just about to retire tomorrow, irrespective of the early retirement uh, they, they program, greatly, yeah. And there's not really going to be payroll savings because they would either they would not be replaced tomorrow or they would not be replaced today. So essentially for that type of person, there wouldn't be payroll savings. On the flip side, you may have people that were going to be here for five or seven or ten years. And there is where you would generate the payroll savings. Okay. Mr. Manager, you and I have had conversations on this and you told me at the time that you would hire back You'd said 50%, but if it's 60%, that, that's about it. You said that the people you hired back 
would be part-time employees working 29 hours so that we wouldn't have to afford them full-time benefits. Is that still your plan, that uh, the replacement staff would only be part-timers? Uh, no, Councilman. Our, our plan is 60 percent. Uh, in areas where I don't have to hire full-time people, um, I would look at part-time people. Um, we, uh, our budget is 55% of our budget is coming from employees. It used to be 67. We need to get it down to 45. Um, so it's more manageable. So in areas where we can consolidate, we will consolidate. In areas where we can look at and say, we don't need a full-time person there, we may be able to get by with a part-time person we would take advantage of that opportunity. That would be based upon knowing who will be leaving and where we can consolidate and, uh, and capitalize on consolidating. You, so I just want to make it, I, I want to understand so I'm clear. Of the 100% that would retire, 60% are going to be replaced with full-time employees? That's <laughs> correct. And the other 40%, those jobs just don't exist anymore. They will not exist anymore. Okay, so where do the part-timers enter the equation? Then? Because if I don't, that 60%, if I don't have to hire 60%, if I can get by with hiring 55 and 5% and part-time, that's where I would like to capitalize on. See, I'm just hugely concerned that we create a workforce of part-time employees. I'm a... I, Many people are surprised to learn this. I'm a, I'm a Democrat, and I'm pro-labor, and I don't want to see a workforce of part-time people who aren't as invested in the city who we then don't have to pay benefits to. I think that's a little bit of a, a bad management move if we bring in a bunch of folk and then just pay them all 29 hours, and then we don't have to give anybody insurance and go, ha, we saved some money. Meanwhile, you know, folks are left on their own, and I, I get it, Obamacare is rolling out, and maybe they'll be able to qualify, but I just, I, I'm not comfortable with that. I, I you know, I, I've, I've d dwelled on it since we've spoken, and, and I'm, I'm concerned with that, that we would do something heavy on the, the part-time side. We won't. It would be evaluated. Uh, i give you an example. We may have full-time people working at certain recreational centers. We may not need that because you got people um, uh, who are not using the parks during school hours. So we would capitalize in using that part-time. Uh, lawn maintenance is, a, uh, is another one. There's certain things that the city does that we have full-time people. We may not need full-time people. We may be able to get the same work product done with part-timers, but in key positions, that really impact customer service, uh, we will replace those individuals uh, back. Uh, so if all 60% of those people that leave, if 60% if, um, if of those positions are key and they are very important to customer service, then of course we would have to hire back everyone for a time, but it would be at an entry level uh, salary because the people leaving in those positions have been with the city for 20, 25 years. Uh, so obviously when someone comes in, they're coming at an entry level. You mentioned to me as well, um, ah shoot, what was the other question I had? All right, I'll go to one of my other questions that I had. Um, when all of these folks retire, Oh, I remember what the first question was. You, you told me you had polled employees. You'd already sent around a survey of some sort to sort of gauge how many people would take advantage of this. I know we don't know that for sure, but in your, in, in your estimation, what did the poll tell you? What kind of information could you glean from that as to the number of people that retired? I mean, honestly, I think sure. everybody will probably take it because it's, it's no penalty, it's extra money, and you get to go leave early and work somewhere else if you want to. I, I can tell you that w the poll did not proceed because we did not, we pulled the item. We will be doing that if this item um, moves tonight. Um, st statistics show that about 30% Take this. 
Well, it's it's mm -hmm. dependent on the enhancement. It, it so depends that's on the, thing, the enhancement. But we're giving them a, an extra percentage point sure. bonus, and we're giving them credit for years. This is not your regular early incentive. I mean, from I, anything I've read up on, this is the, you've even said it in some of your reports. This is a, a I, I forget the word, but this this is a very nice offer to 120 employees to leave early. I'm afraid they'll all take it, and if if there's still a poll you can do. Maybe we should put this off and let you do the poll and then come back because if, if 120 employees leave tomorrow with this meteor retirement plan, we've got sick and vacation we need to talk about. We need to talk about where that money is going to come from to pay everybody out to leave. We need to talk about where the money is going to come from for the salaries of the new people who we're going to bring back in. Uh, right now, for instance, all of these potential retiring employees, their salary is budgeted. It's, it's in the budget that we approved last month. Okay, let's say we're going to use that budgeted money to pay everybody sick out, to get them all and go and they're gone. We don't have any money in the existing budget to pay for anybody new that we bring in. So if 100 people leave and we use the existing budget to pay them and go because we've got sick and vacation of varying levels. Some of the people have been around a long time. They've accrued a lot of days before we capped it off. And now where do we come up with the money to pay for the new employees? There's a lot of real issues financially here. I, 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 I get the idea of needing to save money, but I'm afraid we're going to short-sightedly cost us more in the, in, in the short term than we intended. For instance, according to some of your own statistics, mm -hmm. if more of the people, if it's closer to a hundred percent acceptance rate of this, actually we're going to spend a lot of money now that we don't have sitting around as far as I know um, for those folks t folks to go. Am I correct in my, yeah, my reading of that? In terms of the pension costs, the pension costs, if you turn to the first page of figures in that October 17th sure letter, enough. you'll see what happens to the pension costs in row item K, or I should say L, um, if all 112 members leave, the pension costs would increase by $2.1 million per year for, a ru for the next five years. So basically the... Two million, you said. Two. Excuse me? Two million a year over the next five years. Right. So, so, so essentially it's $10.3 million, 10 .3 million right. so is the full. So you, so you follow my concern. We right now don't know if 12% of the employees are going to take did this Did you look at the salary savings? Could you indicate what the salary savings The salary savings, savings in row item... Um, N in that report is $3.3 .3 million. So you see where we would cover that cost. Okay. Now tell me then, where do we get the money for the new people we're hiring back? It's in the budget. Because it's not in the budget, though. The budget, the budget covers those that are leaving. I mean, I, I sat with budget staff sure. yesterday and on Friday. So we need to get the story straight. C if, can I if, explain it? Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Right now, I have a position in the budget. Someone is making... $60,000. They have been budgeted for the remaining of this year. Right. Mm -hmm. They leave. I have to replace that per person. They're going to come in at 42000 Maybe you don't have to. No, and but, maybe but, I don't have to. But here's to. the thing. When that $60,000 employee leaves, we have to pay off all of their sick and their vacation. They're not somebody who's just joined us because they're not making 60000 if they just joined us. So that 60000 is going to go toward paying off sick and vacation for I don't know how many employees. I don't know how many sick and vacation days. But it's not coming out from the budget. No, but it is. Because it's right coming now, from salary savings, Councilman. But salaries, we don't salary savings will cover that person leaving and their benefits. And there they go. But salary <laughs> savings doesn't cover the new guy then coming in on the back end, the replacement. Because if you're, if 60,000 is walking out the door and 40,000 is coming in next week, that only gives you $20,000 per employee to now pay out all the sick and vacation. That's just not enough. I don't, I don't see how that works. May, may I interrupt for just for a minute? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I would take the analogy as that's why um, Publix for is way better off than a mom and pop store. When we go to a big, a, a mega store, they give you uh, something for a dollar. But if you go to a mom and pop store, they have to give it to you for a dollar fifty because their uh, stock is smaller than the mega store. So if we taking it into um, individual, 
we will see that there is a deficit from what i understand because i have been meeting with the city manager over this for uh, a very long time and i sat with the city attorney as well to understand what the the uh, legal is about it and how administrative is fit um so from what i understand in for what he explained it to me, if we actually taking into consideration one salary, yes, you will see there will be a benefit, a, a deficit. But if you take it as a whole, then you will understand that there will be a, 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 a benefit from the city because the first of all is not. Uh, I would ag be against it if we have an incentive plan that will force upon the employees, telling them that this is what we offer you. You have no way out. You have to take it. That I don't think that's how it is. No. So it's it's a plan that will be available for those that we actually claim that we care for. If they like it, if they care for it, if it's good for them, they will take it. If it doesn't fit or suitable their lifestyle, they will not take it. So I like that part of it. So then I'm confused, so, Mr. Amrose. I'm sure. very um, confused. Your report says repeatedly mm -hmm. the liability could vary significantly depending on which specific members elect to retire. I read that to mean as depending on who retires, we might have to pay more. Yeah, the, the cost of all, for the pension plan, the cost of all 112 people retire under this program would be $10.3 million paid off over five years roughly. If 50% of those 112 people leave, so you get 66 people, you can't just take half of the $10.3 million bill. That, that's the point of that statement, because it really depends on which 66 people leave. You could have 66 people leave, and yes, it is a $5.15 million bill, or you could get 66 people leaving, and it's a $7 million bill or a $3 million bill. It depends on which people, and we have no way to gauge which people would accept it. I, I'm not going to vote for it tonight. The only thing that I would support going forward that would, that would maybe get me to vote for it in the future is if we poll the employees first and we come back knowing in a stronger ballpark figure how many people are about to leave. Because right now we don't know if it's But 25. I would feel very uncomfortable knowing that I am going to vote for something because I know so-and-so is just taking it. It's no longer going to be in the city. So-and-so mm -hmm. will be in the city, so I'm not going to vote for it. Mm -hmm. So no, no, that no, would be talking, discrimination. I mean, I would nation. feel very, very no, 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 uncomfortable no, 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 about, about doing that. By name. I'm not talking me. about by name. I'm not talking about whether or not John Smith is going to leave or Mary Jones is going to leave. I'm just talking about a rough as understanding of the 112 actually 123 if we add the cops in there, mm -hmm. of all of those people who could potentially retire, they've all now had a chance to look at this. They know if they would take it or not within a rough percentage point. So if you came back to me in two 60%. weeks, if you came back to me in right. two weeks and mm -hmm. said, Galvin, you need to be looking at the 25% option, you need to be looking at the 75% option, I would feel more comfortable in, in truly knowing what the economic impact to this would be. Right now, I'm being asked to vote on an economic impact that could be any one of four scenarios, and some of them are a lot more costly than others. I would just like to know how many of the 120 people that could potentially retire are actually thinking they're going to retire under this plan. Otherwise, it's okay. too open-ended for me. Mr. Clerk, there was a motion on the floor. Roll call, please. Yes, Mayor. It was a motion from Councilwoman Sterrell. It was seconded by Mayor Thundro, and this is a motion to approve tab I. Roll call, Mayor Thundro. Yes. Vice Mayor Galvin. No. Councilwoman Steril. Yes. Councilwoman Keys. No. Councilman Bienname. Yes. Measure passes 3 2. <coughs> Tab J. Tab J. Discussion regarding independent review of the soil reuse plan at Biscayne Landing. Is that a what resolution or is that a discussion, it's a discussion. or a presentation? Right. It's a discussion. Uh, I have the outside, um, uh, at the last council meeting, two council meetings ago, uh, this council asked that we provide an independent mm -hmm. study on the soil that is at Biscayne Landing. Uh, tonight we uh, did hire uh, a corporation, West Thorpe, and I'm going to ask them to come forth mm -hmm. and they can do an introduction and provide you an analysis of their report. Hi, good evening, honorable mayor and council members. Mr. City Manager, thank you for inviting me here tonight. I hope that I can help shed some light on this issue for, that's here before you. 
My name is Brenda Westhorpe. Oh. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay, great. My name is Brenda Westhorpe, and I'm the president and founder of Westhorpe & Associates, located at 8101 Biscayne Boulevard in Miami. <coughs> I have a Bachelor of Science in Engineering and a Master of Science in Environmental Engineering, and I'm registered to practice in Florida, California, and Texas. I founded the company 15 years ago, and I personally have over 28 years of experience in environmental engineering, most of it right here in Miami-Dade County. My expertise is in solid waste, and our company has done um, extensive, we have extensive experience in soil characterization within the county, and we have both environmental and civil engineers. As you all know, this material was brought to the site to backfill lakes. It's from the Brickell City Center and um, was initially approved by Miami-Dade Regulatory and Economic Resources Department. Testing was required, which indicated that the soil contains leachable aluminum concentrations in excess of cleanup target levels. RUR and the Environmental Quality Control Board subsequently improved the material for reuse with conditions. The city requested that we perform an independent review and analysis and provide an opinion regarding the soil reuse plan. Our scope of work was to review the existing information, collect 10 soil samples from six different stockpiles, and contract with an independent lab to do analysis for aluminum and SPLP. We were to prepare a report for the manager and prevent present our findings to the city. Um, this material consists of 70% native material and 30% cement grout mixture. <coughs> the cement grout was used to stabilize the material prior to excavating it. The cement grout consists of approximately 8.6% of the slag cement and it's slag cement's a component of uh, the cement grout that's a byproduct of the iron making process. Our review showed that the soil was initially approved in March of this year, and then additional information was submitted <coughs> uh, to Ruhr in May. Ruhr collected five samples in June of 2013, and the results of this sampling indicated that extracts from the soil contained leachable aluminum le in levels that ex exceed groundwater and surface water cleanup target levels. What is SPLP? Um, the EPA has approved procedures for measuring the concentration of various compounds. And this test, the SPLP, is a laboratory test that's designed to simulate the effects of acid rain on waste over time. It stands for Synthetic Precipitation leach Leaching Procedure. And this test subjects a solid, in this case it's a soil, to an acidic mixture for a period of about 18 hours. And then the liquid portion of the mixture is extracted and analyzed, and the solids are actually discharged or um, disposed of. So these are our results, which we did independently. And it shows pretty much the same as what rep uh, was reported by the county, the Ruhr. And it meets the residential cleanup target level for aluminum, which is 80,000 milligrams per kilogram, or 80,000 parts per million, and all the results were below that level. Again, our results were very similar to what was reported by the Ruhr. These samples all exceed the cleanup target levels for aluminum, which is 200 micrograms, which is a part per billion, um, and the, these are the results of our, of our tests, which were independent, but confirmed what was found earlier. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about aluminum so you can put it in perspective. Um, it's found in just about everything because it's the most abundant metal in the earth. It's always found combined with other elements, and most aluminum compounds don't dissolve readily in water unless the water is very acidic or uh, unless the water is acidic or very alkaline, which is why we don't see it in the soil until we run the SPLP test on it. When it's subjected to the acid, then it, 
it comes out. In my research, I was interested to find that aluminum is used in a wide variety of products. We know that it's used in, in water treatment chemicals, it's used in abrasives, but it's also found in consumer products like antacids, buffered aspirin, food additives such as flour and baking powder, um, antiperspirants. Ex exposure to aluminum is generally not harmful, but it can cause problems for workers who breathe in a large amount of dust that contains aluminum um, and or dust or fumes that contain aluminum. Hmm. So how is aluminum regulated? Well, it's, it's not a recro metal, which is hazardous. It's not a hazardous metal at all. It's one of the lighter metals, which is why it's often used in industry. Heavy metals are, are the ones that are more regulated. Um, the EPA has set a secondary drinking water standard for aluminum of 200 micrograms per liter, which is also 200, the same as saying 200 parts per billion. But this level is based on taste, smell, or color, not on levels that would affect humans or animals. So in other words, it's for aesthetic purposes. If you had aluminum in the water, it might present as cloudy. People might think the water was dirty. So it's a secondary level, not a primary level. What do all these numbers mean? I had to write it down to just show you just how many zeros one part per million is. It's equivalent to four drops of, of ink in a 55-gallon barrel of water, um, or 10 to the minus 6. A microgram is uh, one, one microgram per liter is one part per billion, or 1 times 10 to the minus 9, which is equivalent to adding a pinch of salt to a 10 10 10 ton, that's a tongue twister, 10 ton bag of potato chips. Um, the amount of aluminum that we actually take in each day varies a little bit depending on what you read, but um, aluminum in our food would come from natural sources. It could also be from the food ingredients that are added or the additives, um, the water that's used in food preparation. But the amount of aluminum in our, in our diet is small compared to the amount that's in antacids. I was interested to find out that Mylanta, which is an over-the-counter antacid, um, contains 200 milligrams of aluminum hydroxide, while the extra strength Mylanta contains 400. I think there's even another one that's super ultimate strength that contains even more. So it's, it's in a variety of products that we <laughs> consume in a normal, in an everyday, some of us not everyday, but people who have ulcers or <laughs> have a lot of indigestion. Ginger. So, you know, my, my conclusion is that um, aluminum doesn't appear to pose significant threat to human health unless large amounts of aluminum dust are inhaled. Um, the levels in the soil were acceptable until we subjected it to the SPLP test, which is the acidic test. Um, and that sort of makes sense because it doesn't dissolve readily in water, but when you add the acid, it comes out. Um, because our soils here in Miami-Dade County contain a lot of limestone, it's calcium carbonate, it's highly buffered. They tend to have pH values. If you remember our chemistry from high school, it's everything above 7 is basic, below 7 is acidic. Our pH soil, the soil, uh, soil that we have here, pH values tend to be higher between 7.4 and 8.4. So it's a more buffered environment than we would see um, with the L SPLP test. So our recommendations would be that um, if the soils, you know, used, that dust control measures are implemented during construction. I'm sure that's something the county is going to require, but the city could always impose additional requirements for that to make sure you don't have fugitive dust emissions coming off the site. Um, the site does have an active groundwater remediation system, which should present, prevent off-site groundwater migration. Um, in the event that that didn't work, there's groundwater monitoring in place to detect contamination. And um, we understand right now there's a plan to fill in all the lakes, but in the event that that doesn't happen for some reason, we would recommend that signs be posted that say no fishing, no, you know, no drinking, um, and probably no swimming, but because it's a landfill, I wouldn't want to swim in the lake. but. <laughs> So that's, that's all I really have. Um.
Question. Yes. Um, the water that we are using, the, the lake water, is, what do you think it is, um, acidic or alkaline? The P what, what, I, is, what is the pH level of the, of the I water? I have not tested the pH of, of that water, but in our experience throughout Dade County, the pH is generally around 7 or a little higher. Alkaline. We okay. typically don't see a pH below 7 in, in the water that we've tested. And we've worked all throughout the county. Okay. Um, when you just mentioned to post signs, no fishing, no swimming, no... What else? Diving. Yeah. No drinking. <laughs> <laughs> no drinking, yeah. Not potable. Don't drink. So uh, the reason why we need to put those posting, is it because whichever fish that people are going to get in there can be harmful if used by human beings? Or is well, it just because... We don't want anybody to get close to there. What was the idea behind? What is the idea behind posting the no signs? In there? It's really just an it's an added precaution. You know, if you wanted to know if whether or not fish, for example, were going to be, you would have to do tests on the tissue of the fish to determine the tox toxicity, if any. And I'm not a toxicologist, but I would s defer to the gentleman who was a toxicologist, who said that. Um, you know, aluminum doesn't present health of health effects. To I would say that the fish, in general, to to fish and to animals, there's been very little um, to say that. I would say, though, because of the fact that this is a former landfill, that would be a good idea to limit exposure to the to the fish to eating the fish. If someone were to eat fish every day, for example, that's generally when you see more exposure, whether it's aluminum or something else. But these yep. were just recommendations that we posted that, that we suggest that you might want to consider. That we don't eat the fish that come out from that lake? Because Correct. there is no further study that can put our resident at well, ease well, we haven't in we terms of contamination. But we haven't done yeah, we haven't done that study because uh, the material's not there, so we wouldn't be able to produce such a study until years after that material were placed. So then you could do the study. But in the meantime, we would just recommend that as a precaution. Is it the same? That's a, I'm sorry, like an I'm insurance. Yes. The same reason uh, sorry? for the community lakes where they actually post no fishing or no swimming. Yeah. And I, 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 I walk around FIU campus where they have the, um, it's not a lake, but they have a name for it, where they actually store the water. Oh, the storm water. Storm water. Mm -hmm. I know that would come. And then they just post no fishing or no drinking because that water was, has not been treated for drinking or if or there's the fish in there. Yeah, not no, not I just want to make sure that um, to put our resident at ease because you do understand the tremendous amount of concern that was raised in the city by the residents as well um, regarding the, possibly the possible contamination of the sites. And now um, I just want to make sure that it's, you cannot tell us 100% that it's completely safe. Can you? Uh, what that what, I'm sorry, that what is completely safe? Eating the fish or the <laughs> waters? Well, because I remember when we had that discussion here regarding the um, contamination, um, one of the residents spoke and see that, saying that, that the, 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 the fish or the turtles, they were acting funny. <laughs> I remember he said that, didn't he? <laughs> and, uh, I remember that. And, and I just want to make sure that there is no such contamination especially if people buy fish from that particular site and it's not going to be of any harm. And, and Madam Mayor and... I'm just, I'm just, I just want to yes. make sure oh, that okay. mm -hmm. I can tell these people here when they walk out, we're not going to find any fish walking funny or swimming funny lately <laughs> because yeah. there's some possible contamination. Yeah, uh, and we understand that. Uh, but uh, Madam Mayor, what we ask in the firm uh, is to confirm that on the on site and uh, that soil 194 cubic yards of uh, soil is only contain a high level of aluminum that I think that's why they're here 
and for the other question and, and further we're going to address that where's the lady yes. from yes. madam DP. about the health issue You can use this mic. You can use this mic here. Yeah. Yeah. Now that we, you heard the presentation that the uh, independent scientist just mm -hmm. made, what is your take on this? Well, can you introduce I think one of, one of the issues, do I need to state my name, Susan Luck, Bay Harbor Islands, oh. concerned citizen? Uh, I think one of the issues is we don't know small doses over time when people, humans or fish or any other life are exposed. There is a certain absorption into brain tissue. Studies show more is taken in than the body ex ex you know, is able to detoxify Zill. or okay. eliminate. And I think there are a lot of questions. I think there's a particular concern because this is near school sites and there are children that play outside and we know that if it is affecting neurological and brain function over time, we're talking over a lifetime. So children exposed early in life on a daily basis, what happens as they age? There's a lot of studies and I showed two journal articles from Alzheimer's journals from reputable researchers at medical centers and they're looking at aluminum exposure and the increased rates of Alzheimer's disease. So I think it begs the question that it's more than what the government says may be safe in small doses, it's what happens over time. And yes, people are being exposed by many sources of aluminum in the food chain, in aluminum products. That doesn't make it safe just because you can buy it over the counter. And I think that for the city to consider this is uh, a very important measure because it does affect your community and surrounding communities. Thank you. Dr. Krauss, still there? 